Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Third Thursday Conversations with Bright Faculty. And this, this month we are talking with Dr. Lance Poppy. My name is Eileen Thielig and I direct the Lay and Continuing Education program here at Bright Divinity School. And um, we're pleased to have you with us today. I also want to express my gratitude to the Lilly Endowment. It is through part of their support through their Thriving in Ministry initiative that we're able to um, have these conversations with you. Before we get started, I wanted to remind people that we are recording this session. And that means that if you do not want to be identified, uh, please go ahead and you can change your name or express whatever you need to in the chat room uh, and we will be sure to um, answer those questions. I think most of the dialogue will be happening through the chat, uh, through the chat box. So if you do not know where that's located, if you look somewhere on your screen, there'll be a line of um, different icons to use in Zoom and one says chat. Um, and then you just need to type in and hit return and that'll go to, to everyone in the chat box. With that, I think uh, we will go ahead and get started. Uh, I am on the chat today, of course, and we're also joined by Holly Neal, who is the Administrative Assistant for Lay and Continuing Education and Lauren Baxter. Um, all of us will be helping to support the, the background of this meeting and to uh, be looking at chat for you. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to uh, Reverend Dr. Lance Poppy. He's the Granville and Erling Walker Associate Professor of Homiletics and the Director of Disciples Formation here at Bright Divinity School. So Lance, I will give it to you. Thanks. Uh, take it away. I just put in this other earbud. We'll see if that is going to work. I'm getting everything through one ear right now. Um, let me switch this over so I can see as many of you as possible. I mean, it looks like we have about 45. So let's do, when we go to groups here in a minute, let's do groups of four. Um, good afternoon it's it's good to see all of you uh or as many of you as i can fit on this screen at once um i uh i wanted to start off by by I, it says here on my sheet to speak a word of encouragement to those of you trying to preach the good news at this time and i want to try to do that um i think uh, that this work of trying to do biblical interpretation on behalf of a community and and speak uh, a word of gospel to a community at this time is it's crucial work uh thankless work i think um that that that, that the preacher herself is in the midst of crisis the preacher herself is not sleeping well the preacher herself is worried for herself and for her loved ones. The preacher herself is worried for the country and the world. And yet in the midst of all of that personal emotional work and uh, spiritual work uh, to somehow summon, somehow muster the emotional, spiritual, intellectual resources to help your community think and feel Christianly, faithfully, um, about what's happening in the world right now. That is, that's crucial work. And it's, I think that although the world certainly, and perhaps even your church may rarely show uh, the uh, appreciation for, <laughs> for, for what demanding work that is, it is absolutely crucial work. And I think it's work that will pay out in the years and decades ahead. Um, as we um, emerge from this crisis. So I, I mean that as a word of encouragement. I think I do understand what it's costing you to do this work and to try to do it with integrity. And um, I, I, I see it firsthand in my spouse's work every week and in the conversations that we have as she wrestles with 
with how to speak a good word and an authentic word and a, a biblically informed word uh, at this time. And I, I commend you for it and I encourage you to, to continue in it. Um, what I want to do uh, bef- just to start here today is to say a word about what is preaching. What do I think preaching is? Um, those of you who have had me in a preaching class know that I'm about to draw a picture on this whiteboard behind me, and I'm going to give the short version of this little talk. Some of you have heard me say it. It helps get my thinking focused, and I hope it'll help get us all kind of on the same page about um, what we're going to do. And then after I get that idea out there about what is preaching, um, we'll, we'll break up into small groups, and I'll give you a couple of questions to discuss for just a few minutes and then come back and get some feedback. Because the truth is, I, I'm, I don't know what you're going through, what you're experiencing. I feel like I'm, I have a very narrow view of the world right now. Um, and so I, I will be uh, helped and encouraged to hear back from you after we do that. So very briefly, what is preaching? A uh, sketch about what is preaching. So there's a long version of this that has to do with the, the, the hermeneutics of Paul Ricoeur, who's a continental philosopher that's been very influential on me. I'm going to give you the really short version of it and say what I think preaching is. I think preaching uh, begins with the biblical text, which I'm going to give a T for that right here. Wow. Can you guys see that? I'm going to pull the camera out a little bit. Let's, uh, nope, the other way. We, Better? We can see it, Maybe. it's behind your head. It's your head. Yeah, I'm gonna get out of the way. I put the text over there because we all know what the text is. I'm gonna move it, I'm gonna tilt it up a little bit and then zoom it in a little. Not that much, wow, sensitive. More than that. Let's go right there. The biblical text. So what I what I say in class and, and what we talk a lot about in class is the capacity of text to project a world in front of themselves, which I draw like a movie projector. And this circle is the world. Now, what I mean by that, I want to stay with that just for a second. What I mean by that is that text and especially poetic texts, by which I don't mean text that rhyme, <laughs> or even texts that have meter, but by which I mean texts that are designed not to simply describe the world as it is, but to propose alternatives. So narrative texts are a case in point and a very important one. Um, Psalms, which we're gonna be talking about later, are poetic texts. Um, Narrative texts of all kinds, um, especially have this quality of world projecting. And I think a good way to think about this is that uh, hopefully some of you like to read novels because I think the novel in our experience is the quintessential example of this kind of this sort of textual function, what, what texts do. So if you think about sitting down to read a novel, you know, you get in your favorite chair and you get all arranged with your Kindle or your actual, uh, sure enough, physical book or whatever it is that your, your phone maybe. When you, when you open that text and you start to read, what we find is that we're drawn into a space. The words on the page are making claims about something that's happening. People are going places and doing things and settings are being described. And our, our, our physical experience of the world, it makes a lie of those words. <laughs> those words don't describe what we're at. We're actually in our reading chair and there's a clock on the wall and there's a window and perhaps a neighbor outside mowing their lawn or whatever it is that's going on around you. Um, the, but the text says something else is happening. And there's a disconnect between our ostensive domain, the things that we're looking at, and what the words on the page are saying. And there's a very interesting thing about human consciousness that we don't like for language to just be about nothing. We don't like for language to spin its wheels. We're programmed from a very early age that that language should refer, it should point toward things. We like for it to. And if I say this whiteboard marker, you know, we all like that there's a clear referent for that, for that statement. But on, in a novel, the words on the page don't clearly point toward anything, do they? It says that so-and-so went somewhere and did such and such, but none of that's happening. So what we do is that we rescue the reference of that text by creating a space in our imagination for those things to happen. 
right? When you start reading a novel, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, you know, or a fairy tale, once upon a time, whatever it is, you, your imagination supplies a space in which these events start to unfold and you see them in your mind's eye. And it's important that you see them and that you feel them. It's not just thoughts that you're thinking, but there's a kind of eventful quality to narrative right? There's, there's character and circumstance and action and, and uh, conflict and all these things. We, these are all categories of practice that we know about from our daily lives. And here's an example of it in a text. And we can kind of see it in our head. We can play it out and feel along with it and think along with it. We, uh, Recur says we know how to follow the arrow of the plot. <laughs> and, and you'll experience that if you're reading your novel in your reading space, what you'll find is that the ostensive domain fades away in consciousness it does. I'm talking about what's happening in human consciousness and that the world of the text rises up and you find that suddenly what you see and what you experience and what you feel is a matter not of the domain of, of the physical space that you're sitting in. That's all kind of disappeared somehow. And, in, and nor are we thinking about the Kindle, nor are we thinking about the, the, the open book before us. We're thinking along with the plot. We're, we're following the arrow of the plot. That's what I mean by the world of the text. It's that space projected in front of a text. And it's important to remember that this is not uh, the same as the world that generated the text back here behind the text. It's, this is not the same as our everyday experience. It's this third alternative, not the past, not the present, but this some other thing, this, this world proposed by the text. Okay, I could say a lot about that. I'm not going to right now, but just to say that poetic texts of all kinds project worlds in front of themselves. The nature of the world they project is a function of the genre of the text. We're going to be talking about Psalms and the nature of the world they project a little later today. But anyway, you got a text projecting a world out in front of itself, in front, which is to say toward the reader, toward the reader of the text, not back toward the world that produced the text not back to history, but forward toward the reader. And what I like to say is that the reader is complicated. The reader is actually a community of interpretation. But in the case of Christian preaching, the unique situation is that the community of interpretation, the church, my church doesn't look like this. I don't know if yours does. My church is a barn. Uh, but I draw this as a symbolic representation of a church. Sends one designated reader into the world projected in front of the biblical text. Her task is to function as a surrogate. She goes on behalf of a community, which is to say that she goes self-consciously trying to bring to bear with her the concerns of the community. She knows them well. And her role as a reader entering the world of the text is not just to go as an individual on her own behalf, the, one way, the, one, the way one might read a novel, but rather, this is a communal exercise, and she goes as a surrogate. She's a surrogate reader, um, entering the world in front of the biblical text, the particular text that's on, that's 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 you know, perhaps from the lectionary, or perhaps one that she's chosen, or perhaps one that's come up as part of a planned schedule of readings. She goes into the world projected in front of that text on their behalf, and she has a Recur calls it an adventure in the world in front of the text. I'm just drawing arrows to say that there's movement in there. There's something happening in there. She does. She goes in and spends some time exploring it. And for for my students, this is a, a there's a there's been a an exegetical process that I've taught that that helps facilitate this kind of exploration. But you're spending time thinking along with, feeling along with, exploring the world in front of the text. And because she comes from a particular place into the world in front of the text, what she sees there will be different from what some other reader sees there. It, it's not, this experience is not generic. It's, 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 the, it's the result of an interaction between the world that she comes from and the world proposed by the text. There's a, there's a conversation, there's a fusion of horizons, uh, a philosopher named Gadamer says. There's an interaction that's generative of new meaning, right? It's possible to have new memories of Jesus. When people in the base camps in Central America read the Gospel of Luke for the first time, they had new memories of Jesus, said the Catholic theologian that observed what they were doing. 
right? Because the text had an agenda of meaning, but the readers also brought something new and interesting and different. And it's that interaction in the world in front of the text that happens. And then what preaching is, is that she returns to the community to bear witness concerning what she's seen and experienced in the world in front of the text. That's what preaching is. A community commissions and sends a preacher to go into the world projected in front of the biblical text on their behalf, and then to return to bear witness, to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Not just the ideas, but the feelings and the implications and the possibilities that are opened up by this experience in the world in front of the text. Okay, that's the 10 minute version of maybe seven minute version of, of what's an hour and a half uh, presentation. So here's what I propose for the next few minutes, the next three minutes. We're going to break out into groups. There's 59 of us, so we're going to break out into groups of five, right? Or so. And I'm going to paste some text in chat here um, that I want you guys to answer these questions in your small group. You have to do it quickly because you're only going to get three minutes and then you're going to be auto bumped back in. The questions are, um, what are you doing to keep in touch with the people of your church and to keep in touch with what they're experiencing and thinking about right now? That implies that you are doing something, so think about that. Two, what would you say is top of mind for your people right now? And then three, if you get to it, which you probably won't, I'm curious to know, lectionary, yes, no, or sorta. If you don't get to that one, I've got a way to take a poll on that quickly, visually, when, when you get back. But think about, what are you doing to keep in touch with your people? What's top of mind for them right now? In other words, this question, when you go into a text, who are you going on behalf of? What are they thinking about? And how are you finding out what they're thinking about and, and what, what, what they're experiencing? Okay, so can we do break out for three minutes now, Eileen? Thanks, thanks for that work. I, w I, was, uh, I went and I was a fly on the wall in one group. So uh, I think what I'll do is just kind of tell you what they talked about a little bit and then that you can, you can add to this picture. So uh, the question about what are they doing to stay in touch? Well, you know, there's individual Zoom meetings for pastoral care. There's the occasional and rare uh, at a distance outdoor masked conversation <laughs> with someone to, to you know, to address what they're feeling and what they're experiencing. But some mention of calling groups, uh, the elders of the congregation being assigned to call people and, and check in with them. Um, what, what's top of mind? Uh, isolation, fear, worry, anxiety, longing to be back together, longing to be in, in, physical proximity to the church and to be among the saints and enjoying one another's company and, um, and, and a lot of questioning, like, can't we see each other? Can't we find a way to see each other? Um, yeah. So let me just ask if, if you're, if, if you're willing to say, uh, uh, let's have somebody uh, either unmute or through chat or something, what kinds of things did you talk about? Does, does that, get at it, what I just said, uh, or what were some other things that came up? Anyone? A lot of them are worried about their kids going back to school and what's going to happen with that. Yeah, worries about back to school. My congregation is probably 60% or more over 65. And so their concern literally is somebody's going to mess up and bring something home to them. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I mean, in the chat note that says grief. Grief. Yeah, in the chat. Yeah. 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 And, and yes. How long, someone says. Uh, we have a, a lot of conflictedness in our congregation of the wanting to be back and the fear, not necessarily of catching the virus, but of having to quarantine. Yeah. There's another one here about being new to their context and how do you navigate that newness on all the different levels? 
it's amazing how often we are new, new to our preaching context. I think that, you know, it speaks to the, to the amount of sort of how things are unsettled and there's, there is a lot of turnover, if you will, in, in ministry positions. So yeah, what do you do when, when you haven't had a chance to know people in, in the best of times, and then you're in a situation where you're, your understanding of them is uh, impaired by the, the constraints of, of social distancing and so forth. It's an excellent uncertainty, someone says. Yeah. Yeah. I'm intrigued by the idea that the church of today is learning that the church in the original form was small, in homes, not in large cathedrals, not in uh, these uh, things that we've built to attract. And I think we may learn that that model may come back to some extent. Um, it's good go. insight. We have been forcibly divested of the trappings of the institution. <laughs> they just, it's just been yanked out from under us like a rug. And now we're all, uh, you know, trying to figure out the technology of live streaming or asynchronous streaming. And sometimes that goes well, and sometimes it doesn't. And we're not very good at it. it we, we got, we, we spent 2000 years getting pretty good at some things. And now we're not, we're not very good at, at, uh, at, at maybe at, at what we're left with. Yeah, it's, and it does, it does point toward a different future. I think that's one of the things that when the groups that I get together in, one of the, one of the insights that shared over and over again is that when we get back to normal, it's not going to be normal what we get back to like it, like the profound changes afoot. And it's, it's naive to think that we're just going to wake up one morning and find that things have gone back to uh, as they were in the early spring of, of 2020. I, I think that's, yeah, that seems unlikely. Let me do this. I, uh, um, whoops. Let me do this. I want you to, I'm going to say lectionary and you say, yeah, which is to say we do it and we like it. Or you say no, which is to say either we don't do the lectionary or we do, but I don't like it. <laughs> or eh, which is to say sometimes yes, sometimes no, some modified version of that, some local plan that's loosely informed by it. So I'm just going to watch the first screen. Lectionary. You're all going. Eh, well, some of you are going, yeah. Okay, interesting. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, those of you that were on visuals, I, you know, it. I think it's. It. I'm. I'm kind of surprised. I thought more of you would be giving it the thumbs up, but. Uh, but that's why I ask is because. It, um, let me do this. It, in light of the sort of mediocre response to that, I have some thoughts about lectionary text coming up, and I'm going to bump that to the end if there's time. Uh, so maybe maybe we'll talk about that later. So let me say, let me push push on toward some things that I uh, have been thinking about preaching in the midst of the context that we just named. Um, I mean, one thing that maybe got crowded out is the sort of racial reckoning that this country is going through right now. It's top of mind for some of my people and not for others. And I think part of the question is, is there mind share to be thinking about more than my own anxiety and fear about pandemic and perhaps my own anxiety about about economic instability as a consequence of pandemic? One thing I would say, if, if you feel like you can't talk to people about anything, if, if, if you think top of mind right now for your people, and suppose it's true that it's in a mostly white congregation, you might think about, okay, so given that pandemic is what people are thinking about, can we also just imagine together the, that pandemic is disproportionately affecting people of color in this, in this country, both in terms of the, the the physical consequences and also in terms of the economic fallout and also in terms of, of who get, counts as essential workers who have to still bring Amazon packages or, or do other things that, that the rest of us absolutely depend upon them doing. And so it's probably because of the fact that essential work gets classified in a way that it falls disproportionately on people of color, that disease is also falling disproportionately on people of color. So I think that as you think about pandemic and as you talk about pandemic in your preaching which you which you must because it's top of mind and you're not a good surrogate reader if you're not entering these biblical worlds with that on your heart and mind it, think about ways to make room in the imagination of your hearers for how this is affecting other people especially people of color in this country and the, the, to say nothing of of the, the broader implications of black lives matter and the way that's shaping consciousness broadly a, a way that we should be that we should be uh, as preachers sensitive to and and doing our part uh, to 
to redeem the time in terms of, of people becoming aware of privilege and becoming aware of uh, the responsibility that we have to um, our black sisters and brothers and siblings uh, uh, in these times. So let, let me say a little bit about, um, oh, also I just, I just wanna put a word out uh, since I may not come back to this. Um, I'm going over into my browser. I'm gonna put a link in, in chat um, to a, a book, whoops. This is going to look hideous, but if you click that link, it'll take you to Amazon and it'll take you to the book Preaching About Racism, A Guide for Faith Leaders. A colleague of mine who did her PhD at Emory University, Carolyn Helsel, who teaches down at Austin Presbyterian Theological Seminary, has written a short book on preaching about racism, which is to say by a, by a white homiletician for right, white preachers in white congregations thinking about the conversation we need to be having about racism. Uh, because we do proactively need to be having that conversation. Having said that, I gather from your feedback that that pandemic is top of mind, uh, not a thing that surprised me, surprises me. So I, I want to address a little bit about uh, preaching in the midst of pandemic. How are we doing on time? Two o'clock. Okay. Um, I said I, I said something in the promotional material about homiletical punts on third down. I apologize for the middle-aged white guy sports analogy, but uh, that, <laughs> I can't think of a better way to say it, right? You know what I mean by a punt on third down? You've got nothing to lose on third down. You should go for it and try to make the yardage, but you're punting. Why? Because of, because of a failure of nerve, because of, maybe someone will get hurt on this play. Uh, if, we, if we punt it and it goes badly, we could punt again on fourth down. I don't know. Actually, I think that's against the rules, uh, but I, I think, uh, I think that that's not a bad description of a kind of failure of nerve homiletically. Honestly, progressive Protestants in this country should be going for it on third down and fourth down lots of times. <laughs> because why? Because we're losing. We're losing. Uh, it's, it's late in the game when you're losing that you go for it on fourth and not just third down. And I, uh, what I mean by that is that it, it, we should be in a risk-taking mode with our preaching. That's, that's my strong belief. Now, what would that mean in this context, to be in a risk-taking mode with preaching? Um, which I, I think also uh, sort of raises the question, like, what are your options in the midst of pandemic? I came up with three. You can preach hope in the midst of hopelessness. You can preach comfort. I, I know you're suffering. Here's a word of comfort. Or you can preach lament. I'm going to make a case for number three for a minute. And I'm going to do it through reflection on the, on the biblical genre of, of psalms. Um, a long time ago, Ellen Davis, in a, in a Hebrew Bible class at Yale Divinity School, convinced me that that the psalms are modeling a different use of language than most of us are accustomed to even religiously we don't speak in this way that the psalms are modeling the psalms reflect limit experience you know what i mean by that experiences that fall outside the normal range of of what people go through limit experience experience at and beyond the limits of our normal a lot of us are experiencing some things at the limit of what we're accustomed to. Um, and the Psalms model limit expression. The Psalms have a way of talking about experiences that are outside the ordinary. Um, so let me erase this. I know you guys are sorry to lose that beautiful picture of what is preaching. Um, so, I'm going to draw a little picture here again because this is the way I think. I think in pictures. Um, I think let's get a dotted line and say that on the left, what we have are I, I want to say absence. Sometimes I get in trouble when I talk this way with people, and so I'll put up here experience experiences of God's absence. Not to say that God is absent, but sometimes we have experiences of God's absence. Now, 
uh, if your experience of God is, a, is as absent, then as far as you are concerned, God is absent. So I'll say, I'll say that and no more. Over here, presence. Now, when you're talking to God, when you're talking to God, that you're, you're in prayer, and the Psalms are prayer poems, your expression to God is going to fall uh, on one side of the line of, of this line or the other, depending on what you're experiencing. So if you're experiencing God's absence, maybe you'll about here, we'll see something petition, petition, asking. Can you guys see that? Petition. This is when I was a kid, there was a standard prayer formula. Uh, guide, guard, and direct us. <laughs> You're asking for God to guide, guard, and direct. I don't know what the difference is between guide and direct, but guarding, I think, has to do with protecting from harm or evil or something. But that was a thing that you said. Uh, I think that was a nice summary that you said at the end of a prayer when you were afraid the meal was getting cold <laughs> and you wanted to sum up quickly, guide, guard, and direct. In other words, asking for God's help, okay? On this side of the line right here, you might have thanks. God, we thank you for this day. God, we thank you for this food. God, we thank you for uh, the, the gifts that you've given us. We acknowledge that they come from you. What Ellen Davis pointed out to me in a strong way is that in the Psalms, you get something different from this and this. You get, you get stuff further out here that can be classified as praise. And on this side, you get something further out that can be classified as lament. And she very helpfully, I don't know if she got this from Klaus Vesterman, I'm not sure where this comes from, but she drew on the, on the chalkboard a picture of a, of a pendulum. You know what I mean? A pendulum, a, a, a line with a weight on it. And you have to imagine the pendulum swinging, so I'm going to give an arrow. I don't know, maybe is this motion? <laughs> you have to picture the swing of the pendulum. And here's what she said that has stuck with me that has been very helpful to me in interpreting Psalms for preaching, is that you don't, the sort of the physics of spirituality is that if you go to petition in the way you address God, you only ever come out to thanks. This is the way a pendulum works. There are a lot of churches that wishes that, that wish that pendulums worked like this. Whoop, whoop, whoop. That's why we have praise teams and not lament teams at churches. But that's not the physics of spirituality, according to the Psalms. The physics of spirituality is that when you have limit expressions of God's absence and limit expressions of God's presence, and those limit expressions, those 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 experiences on the limit. That, that push us to the very threshold of what we're accustomed to demand language. And what you have in the Psalms is you have a pendulum that swings. There's a kind of linguistic audacity at work and it swings all the way out to lament. Somebody wrote it in the chat, somebody that's been trained in Christian ways of speaking by reading the Psalms. How long, O oh Lord, right? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? <clears throat> My, you know, there's a lot of reference in the Psalms to my bones hurting, my bones melting, my bones, you know, they're like, like at the limit, like this is like, like what we're going through is terrible. The idea being that if in times when we experience God's absence, if we don't know how to say this, and if we don't know how to experience this in an audacious way, in a daring, risky way that people will sometimes not like on first take, then we never get here. When we do get back later, when we get back later, do we just get to hear, oh, it's so nice to be back, right? Or do we get back to hear, to a full expression of praise for being back in the company of the saints? So I, I, in other words, I think part of what it means to preach with authenticity at this moment is to try to take seriously what's happening to us, which is for most of us, maybe for all of us, an unprecedented experience of God's absence, or it often is. I don't know if you're sleeping well, but I'm not sleeping well, and I haven't been since late March. And I wake up in the middle of the night a lot of times, and a lot of times when I do wake up in the middle of the night, part of what I think is, 
where is God in all this? I see that my, my colleague, Professor Cherry, is going to be addressing the question of where is, where is God in the midst of pandemic. I, I joked at the beginning, I sure would like to have heard that before I had to say this stuff. Because sometimes that's an open question to me. Where is the God in the midst? Where is God in the midst of pandemic? Um, so uh, let me give you, I, I read through the Psalms again, thinking about uh, talking to you today. And I made some notes of, of passages or psalms in particular that struck me as particularly helpful. Um, there are many, but let me, for the sake of time, jump to Psalm 42, which is a psalm of longing. Longing, which is one of the things that was named in our small groups. As a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. Yeah, my tears have been my food day and night. While people say to me continually, where is your God? I mean, people may not be literally saying that, but I think a lot of us are saying it to, our, to, to ourselves. Uh, and, and get this, verse 4 of Psalm 42. These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I went with the throng and led them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of thanksgiving, a multitude-keeping festival. It's a memory of worship, right? It's not worship, it's the memory of worship, which, which in some ways is, is, makes the longing all the more poignant. The, the absence of being in the presence of God, the absence of being uh, in the presence of our co-worshippers. Um, and the psalm goes on to ask, why are you cast down on my soul? So what I'm saying is that that's good modeling for prayer language, but it's also good modeling for sermonic language. I think if you think about the world projected in, in front of Psalm 42, it's a world in which we care deeply that we have lost something. We're not, we're not repressing our concern about it. We're not pretending that we, it's no big deal. We're fine. I'm an introvert anyway. What, whatever it is that we're telling ourselves that's a, an attempt to, to avoid the feeling the feels of what this is like and expressing that to God. Psalm 42 is, is an is pressing you to, to not punt on third down there, but to, to go ahead and explore what that feels like. It's the world projected in front of Psalm 42 is a world that takes seriously what we have lost and takes seriously our questions about what this means about the nature of God, which may have to be renegotiated for many of us. And what I'm saying is that in preaching, you can explore that space. Um, on this same theme, just since we did that, look at 74. Now, this is a case where the analogy, you have to be a little creative for it, right? This is, a, this is about national humiliation. It's about the temple being destroyed and defiled, and it's about our, our worship being mocked. So this is clearly a psalm reflecting exile and the situation of exile. And I understand that it's, it's complicated to draw analogies between Israel's national experience and our ecclesial experience, certainly uh, oh, fraught to try to draw connections between Israel's national experience and our national experience. But, but preaching is all about exploring the aspects of analogies that work. And this psalmist, oh God, why do you cast us off forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pastor? pasture? We do not see our emblems. There is no longer any prophet, and there is no one among us who knows how long. How long, O oh God, is the foe to scoff? Uh, just this idea of, of the, they set your sanctuary on fire, they desecrated the dwelling place of your name. I mean, this is the literal destruction of a worship space, but it speaks analogically, metaphorically, powerfully to this idea that what we're experiencing is an absence of our, yes, as someone said before, our, the institutional structures that have buttressed our faith. And the, the psalm gives expression to that and gives permission to the Christian preacher to explore some of that. Um, now, again, why would you do that? Well, you would do that, I think, because it's the truth. <laughs> and because when you don't speak the truth, and when you don't dare in a sermon to authentically speak what we're, what we're truly experiencing. I mean, it's weird because in the Psalms, what you have is people talking back to God, which is not normally what we think of as the, 
as the function of the canon. But the fact that the Psalms have been canonized is the tradition testifying to us that speaking honestly with God, being articulate with God is a form of the word of God, right? I mean, I don't think I'm too out of bounds to say that, right? That, right, like taking seriously what the psalmist says to God and interpreting your situation through that way of talking is a form of the word of God. So this is important work for the preacher to think about what it means to lament honestly and therefore to open up the full range of experiences of presence in the future. Because if we close this thing down and say, ah, it's fine, and um, God, we sure do wish you would end this pandemic, uh, sure would be nice. You know, you're, you're really closing in linguistically, and I think you're closing in theologically, and I think the inauthenticity of that is poignant, especially when the sermon is being preached by Zoom, <laughs> you know, or the sermon is being, it's, it's coming to people through a, a, a jittery uh, live feed that's not quite working, or, uh, or asynchronously, uh, uh, like a fireside talk by YouTube, and and, and, and it's like, how can you speak as if this is normal? I, like in the very moment of listening to this sermon, I'm, I'm hyper conscious that this is not an, uh, it's, it's not okay. And I think this, this, the preacher will do well uh, uh, to, to name that. Um, almost out of time and I wanna take some time so you can talk back to me and, and complain or redirect uh, or otherwise fix whatever it is that I'm not saying that I should be saying. Um, but I do think that in terms of sermonic plot, this doesn't have to be a situation where the sermon just begins and ends in despair. Most Psalms of Lament don't work that way. There is, there is, there are plot, there, there, are, there is plot to most Psalms of Lament. There's movement toward at least remembrance of God's actions in the past, deeds of old in, in several cases, or toward the hope of God's actions in the future. It's not always the case. I mean, there, <laughs> there are certainly cases where, uh, where it's gloom and doom from beginning to end. I'm looking at you, Psalm 88. Um, but it, it, usually there are resources within a given psalm for some, for some plot that takes into account what we long for or what we hope for or where, or where we're moving. Um, you know, the language of praise in, in the psalms, uh, most of those psalms, it's just straight praise all the way through. Uh, Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise God in the heights. Praise God, all the angels. Praise God, all God's hosts. Praise God, sun and moon, shining stars, highest heavens. This is Psalm 148. It's just pretty much a straight run. You get that a lot. But the Psalms of Lament very often have a, 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 a coda or some other movement within the Psalm in which something more than just lament is uh, is expressed. So I think even staying within a psalm, it, it opens up some sermonic plots that include a counter word or a word of hope or, um, yeah, something like that. Um, I got some things I could say about lectionary text coming up, but let me just stop for a moment. I haven't even been looking. Uh, is there anything? Nope, there's nothing in text. Not a thing. Uh, any, would anybody like to raise something that I haven't thought of or, or comment or a question? something we haven't talked about that you think needs to be said? It's hard when there's uh, many people and there are 50. Well, Lance, I would throw in the political election coming up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, I mean, as a source of anxiety, as a, as a source of anger for some of us, I mean, it's, this is part of the difficulty of knowing, knowing where people are. I mean, the temptation is to think that your people are where your Twitter stream is, but they're probably not. There's probably some, uh, some slippage between what you're taking in online. Uh, there's probably, you know, yeah. I mean, I, <clears throat> it's easy for me to say because I'm a tenured professor and I understand that that you can get fired for things that you say. But like if, I mean, if I were preaching this Sunday's text upcoming, the Hebrew Bible reading and the semi-contiguous line of year A, which is Exodus 1, 8 through 2, 10, I mean, you've got, you know, you've got Pharaoh, the new, the new king, and you've got this group of women that are subverting Pharaoh's purposes, a fabulous 
feminist reading, just just crying out for the preacher to acknowledge it. Um, uh, this ensemble of women that are subverting the work of this of this uh, of this tyrant who thinks that only the young boys are a threat and so has ordered their death. But if you preach that text, you should have you should have Pharaoh tweeting. You should have Pharaoh tweeting his hatred for immigrants. You should have Pharaoh tweeting his desire to build a wall around the area of Egypt where where the other is is housed. You should I mean I I would I would stop punting on third down and fourth down on some of this stuff because it, but I also do think that there is a there there is a there is a, a sense in which the anxiety that the election produces is layered on top of the other anxiety. So some of the Psalms of enthronement can be helpful here. I mean, as long as we're in the book of Psalms, this, this idea that it's that 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 it's 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 God that is sovereign, it's God that is in charge, it's God that I mean I I could see a word like that as well. Maybe you shouldn't preach that uh, that 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 the Pharaoh is tweeting. Maybe you get fired for that. I don't know. Some of you are smiling. Some of you are smiling nervously. Poppy, could I ask a question? Uh, I, don't, I think. Go for I, it. I was, yeah. I was curious about the the hope piece, and uh, I, I'm not usually one that's talk a whole lot about hope as I said with the lament and absence stuff a lot but I'm I'm just thinking of the conversations I'm having on a daily basis through Zoom I feel like people are simmering in lament just kind of like all week long and I just wonder if there's a way you might suggest expressing that authentically and honestly just like you were saying the lament yeah but also being I'm, able to tap into some other energy yeah. yeah michael i mean i i pointed toward the fact that in the psalms there is there is reference to hope there in psalms of lament there's often a reference to god's deeds of old which 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 carry the implicit promise that god will act again there's uh there is um I mean, the, I think the precondition of the psalm is that you think you're being heard, that you can talk honestly with God about what this feels like and that you're heard in that. But part of the point of preaching lament is that if people are crying out, you don't want people compartmentalizing their lives so that they cry out in one domain, but theologically, all they can say is God is good all the time, all the time, God is good. Well, not right now, God is not, not in my experience. Uh, God is uh, super negligent right at the moment with respect to politics in this country and pandemic uh, response in, the, in this country and with respect to m my people in my church that are slowly losing their minds because they're isolated from one another mm -hmm. and have anxiety and need the comfort of their peers. So I think you're right that once you start to conjure that, you've really done a thing, although I think you want to do that in the presence of God. If you're going to talk about that stuff, you should talk about it to God and you should talk about it in the presence of God. But I do think that the word of hope is implicit there that God, that God does care about those things and that, we, that, that to speak it to God is in a sense, an act of faith to say that God will hear that and that, 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 that won't be the final word. Um, now, whether or not the Psalms are the best place to go for preaching hope um, I don't know because they swing between <laughs> these ex these extremes of expression and and perhaps they're not uh, the best place to go. Maybe someone else has a better word there. I saw a hand. I thought it was helpful. So I did the semi-continuous lectionary of Genesis through the Exodus story, and I think we ended with Moses. And I was surprised with reading those stories. There is such lament, right? Like it started out with, Abraham and Sarah and the lament of not having a child and, 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 and you can build in, you know, I built in like the lament of what we're, what, what we've hoped for and had been taken away and never came to be. And yet there was laughter because the impossible became possible. And following that cycle was super helpful. And it's the familiar stories that made people feel good. We know this story. We, we know Abraham and Sarah, we know Moses, we know Hagar. 
and to, to use those stories that we're already familiar with to live in that lament with them, but also to, to, to see how the story ends. It may not be this generation where the family dynamics are fixed, but the next generation, what happens in God's continual remaking of the covenant promise is helpful. People are reminding those familiar stories of covenant remade, even when we've screwed it up, haven't worn our mask, whatever it might be, you know, elected whoever, and that God still continues to make covenant with people and tries and tries again and again and again. And I was amazed at seeing that in the continuous, you know, the semi-continuous story that every week was a story from almost every single week that's that was the, the text and so I think sometimes we forget as preachers these familiar stories that we skip over because everybody already knows this story that's that's helpful Cassie I I, I will say that you get the in the songs which I've been thinking about you get the whole array of very human responses you get the you get the crying out and, and you know how you know how could we sing God's songs in exile I, and the, including lashing out violently right like like may their little ones be dashed against a rock you get that now what is that that's limit expression clearly there you're not modeling ethics in that psalm <laughs> you're modeling honesty and prayer but but also uh, like there's a place for that i don't think that preaching needs to say look here's the solution to the thing like like your sermon is not going to solve pandemic right Hopefully a vaccine is going to solve pandemic, but that's not what a sermon is going to do. But, but in the meantime, the human heart, yes, can be directed back toward times of God's faithfulness in the past, which is what Cassie's talking about in which that semi-continuous cycle, which continues next week with, with the burning bush scene from Exodus three and the week after that, at, uh, um, at Passover, uh, you know, that, that sort of narration of events, which is alluded to in the Psalms and occasionally performed in the Psalms. But yeah, I mean, maybe, Michael, part of the answer is Psalm 23, which we only bring out for graveside services. But I mean, it's a word of comfort that, uh, that I read again and reading through the Psalms and thought, this is a word for this moment to, to rehearse poetically God's care. Even, even, and probably especially at a time when it's not experienced. Um, um, I think about a, a, a psalm like Psalm 73, which is a wisdom psalm, which has in it this idea of, you know, everything's fine, but sometimes I look around and it doesn't seem fine. That people, uh, the, the wicked prosper and the, and the faithful suffer. And in Psalm 73, ironically, the turning point comes when the person goes into the sanctuary of the Lord. In other words, goes into the place of worship and experiences a change of perspective. That, that's an interesting narrative that unfolds in the 73rd Psalm. Um, but again, part of our problem is that we're deprived of the experiences, which in the Psalms become the turning point for perspective. It's, it's, it, it's, it, for us, it's worship that we've lost. And so those Psalms of exile that point toward losing, seeing this temple desecrated and losing the experience of being together that are, that are especially poignant. Um, yeah. How to preach hope without being Pollyannish, you know, without being, without being like, oh, it'll be fine. Um, I will say that I think telling the truth about what we're experiencing creates a, 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 an aura of credibility for when you say, you know what, this is not going to last forever. God is faithful and God does have God's eye on us, despite all appearances to the contrary. We, we are kept in God's care and we, there will be another day, there will be uh, another experience. I think that can ring truer out of the mouth of a preacher that's, that's been fulsome in her engagement with the language of lament as well. And I think, I don't say that sermons, that the whole plot should be gloom, doom, despair, and lament. I just want to say again that, for, that sermons have plots, they need movement. And there needs to be some movement at the end, unless it's a Good Friday service, there needs to be some movement at the end other than uh, this, this really sucks all the way down and that's all there is to say. Um, so, it's, yeah, that's what, yeah. I think, Michael, too, if you haven't had a chance to look at Walter Brueggemann's new book about preaching in pandemic, um, it came out like maybe early May and kind of compiles some, some previous writings of his that like, that's a good place to start too. Um, 
isn't it perfect that Walter Brueggemann already has a book about preaching in pandemic? The man has never had an unpublished thought. No, I, I really appreciate, yeah, Brueggemann. I haven't looked at that, but I, I thought a lot about Brueggemann. Brueggemann's treatment of the Psalms, uh, orientation, disorientation, and reorientation as a theme for thinking about preaching uh, the Psalms in the midst of pandemic also has been helpful to me. I don't know if that book includes that essay. Yeah, I've been reading recently, <laughs> I've been reading recently um, The Practice of Prophetic Imagination, the new one that came out in 2013, and I've assigned it for a couple of classes recently. I highly recommend that. Put it in, in chat, The Practice of Prophetic Imagination. In terms of like how to deal with some of the stuff that's going on in terms of the racial, racial reckoning that we're coming to terms with and in terms of politics in this country right now, the practice of prophetic imagination is really helpful in that Brueggemann reminds us that the Hebrew Bible prophets are not actually issue oriented. They're actually theological in their outlook and that their, their issues on social justice emerge out of a theological sensibility that they're primarily what they're nurturing. I think progressive Christian preachers would do really well uh, to pay close attention to uh, to what's being said there. Um, we are at two thirty. Ah, uh, fair enough. So, I you had, did you have like just a wrap up station? Um, something you wanted to say? Yeah, I've been saving the real answer until now. Uh, <laughs> Go for it. I would just say, may the words of your mouth and the meditations of your heart be pleasing in God's sight. Thank you, Lance. Really appreciate it. Um, thank you all for being with us today. And you'll be getting an email from, from me uh, that will give you a link to both the feedback form for, because um, we appreciate your comments back on this. This is kind of a new format for us and we're interested in, in what you have to say. And it will also have, um, well, there's, there'll be a link there, but just so you know, Bright Divinity School has a channel on YouTube and the Third Thursday Conversations are a playlist on that channel. So you, if you missed the last couple of ones, you can go to those, or you can also, um, and probably a, a week from now or so, this one will be posted in case you want to go back and revisit it.